So our, my party has decided that we will put two people there. Dr Tan Cheng Bok confirms the Progress Singapore Party will take up two non-constituency MP positions in Parliament. If you're a long-term pass holder and essential business traveller in Singapore, you can soon travel to Malaysia. And Singapore slumps into a recession with a record GDP plunge. Is this as bad as it will get? Good evening, you're watching The Big Story. I'm Olivia Kuei. And I'm Harianto Diman. Remember, you can subscribe to the Straits Time channel so you never miss a single episode. Mr Leong Manwai and Ms Hazel Pua of the Progress Singapore Party have accepted two seats in Parliament as non-constituency MPs, as the so-called best losers of general election. Both were part of the PSP team in West Coast GRC that narrowly lost to the People's Action Party team led by Communications and Information Minister S. Iswaran. Now, during a press conference this afternoon, Mr. Leong and Ms. Poir said despite their personal reservations early on about the NCMP scheme, the election results show that there is an appetite for alternative voices in Parliament. In this election, even though we did not win the uh, election in West Coast GRC, uh, but still we managed to get 48% of the votes, which is still a significant number. And so I feel that um, this is an opportunity for us to bring their voices into Parliament. Uh, we will demonstrate to the Singaporean voters that a strong alternative voice uh, is very good for the, uh, for the country. That's what we want to set out to do immediately. Yeah. Party Chief Dr Tan Cheng Bok added that they look forward to working with the Opposition Workers' Party in Parliament. Also, historically, I have been quite close to Pritam, Sylvia. We have always been very good friends. And uh, in fact, we share many, many common things, ideas, policies or so. So it's a good. We are now going like a team now. Huh? Uh, the whole world, uh, workers' party, they take the lead, we will, we will help them and they will also give us, I'm sure, information. To take this discussion further, we're joined by one of the editors leading the Straits Times' GE coverage, Jeremy Ao Yong. Welcome back, Jeremy. Now, perhaps some would have wanted the man we just saw, PSP Chief Dr Tan Jing Bok, uh, in, e in one of the NCMP uh, seats. So, what is your opinion of uh, Mr Leong and Ms Pua? Well, Olivia, well, first off, I think there was never any hope that <laughs> Dr Tan would actually take up one of those NCMP seats. He had made it very clear uh, during the hustings, during the campaign, that if the party were to get it, as it has, that he would not be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think he has argued that since he has been an MP for so long, he was MP in Ayaraja SMC for 26 years, that you know, taking on that seat would be... Okay, he didn't say this out loud, but I, I, can, I got the sense that he would see it as almost a step down. After having been MP, now he re-enters the House as an NCMP. Uh, the other thing that I guess he was thinking about when, he, when the PSP chose its uh, two NCMP candidates, which ended up to be the Vice uh, Sec Gen, Yong Man Wai, and the Vice Chairman, Hazel Pua, was renewal. And he, Dr. Tan talked a lot about renewal, even throughout his campaign and after the campaign. After all, he, is the, he was the oldest candidate running in the election. He's 80 years old. Um, he, a lot of people are wondering if at 85 he will show up at the next election. So the longevity of the party depends very much on renewal. Mm -hmm. And parliament could serve as quite an important platform for renewal. And so even before they made the announcement today, uh, I think a lot of people expected that these would be the two that they would choose for the MP NCMP scheme, mainly because they were already seen as uh, likely the likely next generation of the party. Uh, Mr. Leong is 60. Ms. Pua is 49, I believe. Both have quite uh, good CVs. They uh, were both former PST scholars and both had some, um, some success in the professional world. I believe Mr. Leong was former managing director of OCBC Securities. Ms. Pua, um, I think, has this private school chain, private tuition chain. 
and she is also Miss Pua has uh, a little bit more experience in politics than uh, Mr. Leong. She was she started off with Reform Party. She was chief of NSP for a while before ending up in uh, PSP. Right. Uh, Jeremy, both Mr. Leong and Ms. Pua have criticised uh, the NCMP scheme. What do you think uh, they'll bring to Parliament? Ah, well, on the criticism of, NC on the S on, of the NCMP scheme, uh, I think, you know, I've, I've, I'm not that young. I've gone through a few elections. <laughs> uh, it's a dance that we go through nearly every election. Mm -hmm. There's a criticism of the NCMP scheme during the campaign, and no matter what the criticism is, no matter who, uh, who is offered the seat at the end, they end up taking it, or the party ends up taking it. Because, um, you know, if we strip away the politics of it, so in, in the hustings, you will hear arguments at the extremes. Uh, one, on one side, you will hear that the NCMP scheme is completely equal to, the MP, to an MP. It's, not exactly the same. On the other side, you'll hear uh, criticisms of the NCMP scheme as a means of impeding the progress of the opposition. Also not quite true. I mean, if it was very bad for the opposition, they wouldn't take it up. Yet after every election, the opposition has taken up the NCMP scheme. Uh, so that, that, as far as it goes for the criticism of the NCMP, what they will bring to Parliament, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, so far, the various NCMPs have done decently well in debates over the, over the years. And um, I, I guess we'll have to see. This is a new party with people who have never gone to Parliament before. We'll see how they perform. Ah, speaking of, uh, of course, uh, you know, far, um, a few of, of, of the newly elected MPs are also you know, newcomers, first-timers. So with WP already having 10 elected seats, Dr Tan said there will be collaboration between uh, PSP and WP in providing an opposition's voice in Parliament. How effective will they be, do you think? Wow, this is again a, another thing where the answer is it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen principally because uh, this is uncharted territory. Um, we've had more than one opposition party in Parliament before. We've had SDP and WP, or WP and uh, SPP, like Mr. Chiam and uh, Mr. Lo Tia Kiang were in Parliament together for a long time. But we've never really seen that much cooperation between two different opposition parties in Parliament. And there wasn't even that much impetus to do so. This time is different. Uh, because there's a formally appointed title, the WP's uh, Secretary General Pritam Singh uh, will be given the title Leader of the Opposition. That seems to signal to me that there does need to be some collaboration between WP, the 10 WP MPs, and then the two PSP and uh, NC MPs. It's, it hasn't happened before, so you know, I'm, I guess I'm like, just like everybody else, I'm waiting to see how that will work out. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. Always a pleasure to speak with you. We were speaking to Jeremy Ao Yong, who's part of the GE team here at The Straits Times. In other news, Singapore and Malaysia today agreed to start implementing reciprocal green lane and commuting arrangements for long-term pass holders and essential business and official travellers with a target to have the necessary systems and processes in place on August 10th. Both countries said the proposed August 10th date will give the relevant agencies on both sides a time to finalise the SOPs of the two initiatives. The requirements, health protocols and application process involved for entry and exit into Malaysia and Singapore will be published 10 days before the implementation. Eligible travellers under the reciprocal green lane must abide by certain measures including taking COVID-19 swab tests and submitting their itineraries. Meanwhile, their periodic commuting arrangement will allow Singapore and Malaysia residents who hold long-term immigration passes in the other country to periodically return to their home countries for short-term leave. This if they spend at least three straight months in their country of work. They'll also be allowed to re-enter their country of work after their home leave. Singapore and Malaysia also agreed to develop other schemes for cross-border movement like a daily cross-border commuting proposal for work purposes. 
Now, COVID-19 has pushed the Singapore economy into a recession with a record plunge in GDP. Figures out today show the economy shrank 41.2% between April and June, the biggest quarterly contraction on record. That's compared to the first three months of the year when GDP contracted 3.3%. The April to June period also happened to be the time when the circuit breaker was in effect. We're now joined by Head of Treasury Research and Strategy at OCBC Bank, Selena Ling. Hi, Selena. Now, Selena, the GDP numbers are worse than analysts expected. Uh, why is this so? Well, actually, it's quite close to what we were expecting, about a 40.2% quarter-on-quarter drop from the first quarter. Um, year on year terms, at 12.6%, uh, it is a little bit worse than what the market consensus was looking for. I think, uh, you know, with the sense that this is an unprecedented lockdown situation and the circuit breaker, um, it was probably anyone's guess as to how big the impact would have been. For instance, construction sector, we thought that, um, you know, it, we're going to see a huge 85% um, uh, drop uh, quarter on quarter, but actually, as it turned out, actually, it was even worse than that. So I guess we are kind of in unprecedented territory. Um, this mm -hmm. is a record drop. Uh, both for the construction and the services sector due to the two-month circuit breaker. Um, you know, the question is not so much what happens in the second quarter, but I think really what's the recovery path going ahead into the second half of this year. Yeah. Hmm. On the recovery path, the Singapore government has set aside uh, four budgets already, totaling $93 billion to cushion the economic impact of COVID-19. Do you think a fifth budget is going to help or what else can be done to aid the recovery of the nation's economy? I think at this juncture, um, it is uh, not immediately clear that there is a need for a fifth budget. And I say this with some caution because we acknowledge that second quarter was really um, a record of contraction. Nevertheless, mm. I think uh, if you look at the full year growth expectations, uh, we're still looking at about a contraction of 5.5% uh, year on year. And the official growth forecast of minus 4 to minus 7% also remains intact. So I guess it's within a realistic range, uh, you know, as far as the second quarter growth numbers are concerned. So at this juncture, you know, as you mentioned, they have already front loaded a significant amount of both fiscal and monetary policy easing. Um, probably they will want to wait and see, uh, you know, what happens from here. Largely also because um, the global COVID-19 pandemic is still relatively fluid. So for instance, for the third hmm. quarter, we think uh, growth in terms will still be negative. There will still be a contraction year on year, yeah. but probably it's going to be a little bit less severe compared to the second quarter. So I think uh, as far as fiscal policy is concerned, um, there is a likelihood that they may consider to extend, for instance, uh, some of the job support scheme and the other hmm. uh, aid packages, uh, measures that they have to help businesses mainly if the third quarter recovery story is more muted than what they initially expected. Right. But I don't so think we should get our hopes up for another big uh, yeah. Again. Yeah. yeah. So now let's uh, put this into perspective. So a record 41.2% plunge in GDP. Now how bad uh, is Singapore's downturn compared to the rest of Asia and even the rest of the world as well? Well, actually, it's uh, a little bit premature to compare, mainly because Singapore is one of the earliest countries to actually mm. uh, announce its second quarter uh, flash numbers. So I'll give you an example. Um, this Thursday, we get China's uh, second quarter growth numbers, and that is the one that market participants are watching very, very closely, mainly because China is seen as the first in and first out of the COVID crisis. And if you recall, in the second quarter, actually, they started to restart their factories and reopen for business. So the sense of whether they will see a sequential move uh, improvement from the first quarter will probably be a good gauge for the rest of the world as they reopen the economies as well. Well, thank you, Selena, for helping us make sense of the numbers and, and the situation as well. It was always a pleasure to speak with you. We were speaking to Selena Ling, Head of Treasury Research and Strategy at OCBC Bank. And here are today's COVID-19 numbers. The Health Ministry confirmed that 347 new cases, including seven community cases comprising one Singaporean and six work pass holders. There were also two imported cases who had been placed on stay-home notices upon arrival here. 
Migrant workers living in dormitories made up the vast majority of the other cases. The number of total cases in Singapore is now over 46,600 and more details will be announced later tonight. Meanwhile, Tan Tok Seng Hospital said today that human error in its laboratory had led to a false diagnosis of a student who was reported to have COVID-19. The secondary one female student from Jurong West Secondary School was reported last Friday to have tested positive. She was swabbed because she had been in contact with a schoolmate who was previously confirmed to be infected, and her and another patient's specimens were cross-labeled in the TTSH lab. The hospital said the student is well and has been discharged. The other patient, who was in isolation, has since been admitted to the National Center of Infectious Diseases and remains stable. A new isolation facility at Singapore General Hospital with 50 isolation rooms will admit confirmed and suspect suspected COVID-19 patients from tomorrow. It will also admit patients with other infectious diseases. The medical team there will use contact-free monitoring to detect early warning signs of patient deterioration, which will allow them to intervene early. Multimedia journalist Renee Poe files this report from SGH. A new isolation facility at Singapore General Hospital will start admitting confirmed and suspected COVID-19 patients from tomorrow. It will take in up to 50 patients, including those with other infectious diseases. At Ward at Boya, patients stay in negative pressure isolation rooms with an attached toilet and shower. The care team uses technology to interact with patients, minimizing unnecessary risk of exposure. Clinicians can monitor patients' vitals remotely through a biosensor worn on their wrists and intervene if the patient's condition deteriorates. Patients can also make requests through video teleconferencing or a mobile app. It has got that uh, smartphone itself in there. Right, so the patients could, for example, ask for Milo or biscuits or ask to even speak to someone because they feel unwell. Right, all the staff, by talking to them, can make an assessment how well or unwell they are. So this actually improves our efficiency in how we deliver care. If an X-ray is required, patients will be brought to an on-site X-ray booth. Only one radiographer wearing an N95 mask is needed to operate the machine. If their condition worsens, patients will be resuscitated in a treatment room with a ventilator before being transferred to the ICU in the main building. The facility also has a medical preparation room, nurses' stations, and a rest area for staff. Located within a car park, construction of the 3,200 square meter facility took six weeks to complete. From the design itself, we needed to elevate this whole area to allow sewage, water, piping below. Uh, we had to look at how we place all the wards. These are very specific, purposefully built isolation wards. So we needed to think about how we're going to deliver safe care to the patients so we would be able to use this facility to deal with other infectious diseases even after the pandemic uh, quietens down. The number of dengue cases continues to surge with more than 1,600 people diagnosed last week. That's a 16% increase from the previous week. It was the fifth week running that more than 1,000 dengue cases were reported. As at 3 p.m. yesterday, over 17,200 people have been infected, exceeding the annual infection numbers of, for all previous years, except for the epidemic of 2013-2014. At least 16 people have died from dengue this year. Meanwhile, NTUC's top leadership today reaffirmed its support for Labour Chief Ng Chi Meng and said he will remain its Secretary General. Mr Ng became Labour Chief in 2018, taking over from Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh. Questions were raised about Mr Ng's position after his People's Action Party team in Sengkang GRC lost to the Workers' Party in last Friday's election. A cabinet minister has held the Secretary General post for the last 40 years, but NCUC President Mary Liu said today that while the two roles are inextricably linked, they are independent of each other.
Good evening, I'm Dylan Ng. Here's what's making headlines around the world. A total of 308 people from 72 families were affected after their villages were hit by flash floods yesterday in Malaysia's Negeri Sembilan state. A total of five villages were affected after authorities said heavy rain caused river waters to overflow. The entertainment world has been shocked by the death of Grant Imahara, co-host of TV show Mythbusters. The 49-year-old was part of the popular science show, joining in the third season in 2005 and stayed with the show until 2014. Early reports say Imahara died of a brain aneurysm. The body of Glee actress Naya Rivera has been found in the California lake. The actress was presumed to have accidentally drowned after going missing last Wednesday. She had rented a boat on Lake Peru with her four-year-old son Josie, who was found unharmed. An initial examination found no evidence of foul play. Metro Manila is set to go back under lockdown this week as the Philippines struggles to keep up with a recent surge in coronavirus cases. Residents of Navotas, one of 16 cities that make up the sprawling capital region of 12 million, will have to stay home for a fortnight, just six weeks after emerging from a three-month lockdown. The Health Ministry has been reporting around 2,000 new cases a day across the country, from just 500 during the lockdown. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam said that an unofficial citywide election conducted by the pro-democracy camp over the weekend might have violated new national security laws. The weekend election drew more than 600,000 votes in what Democrats describe as a symbolic protest vote against tough new laws imposed by Beijing. The city's opposition camp is aiming to seize majority control in the 70-seat legislature for the first time from pro-Beijing rivals by riding a wave of anti-China sentiment stirred by the law, which critics say has gravely undermined Hong Kong's freedoms. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Dylan. So those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. We will now leave you with a snippet of this year's National Day Parade theme song titled Everything I Am, which is a tribute to Singaporeans' community spirit. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story. Everything I am